Well, hey everyone, it's Maggie Bot, and today I'm doing a more lifestyle vlog, just a chance to say thank you and catch up with you all. Um, I have some games news where if you are just interested in some game stuff, then you can go. I'll put the timestamps down in the description. You don't have to hear me rambling, but uh, in an effort to put more content out more often, I am going to start incorporating some other tasks into my vlogging. So uh, I really needed to make some soup tonight, so I'm going to make soup while I chat games with my little notes here. And um, because it was kind of a rough day on Twitter today, it was just this like monster, weird, hashtag nightmare. So I, I gifted myself a new pen because that always makes me happier. So um, yeah, let's do it. So as you may or may not know, last week I went out to a trade show out in New Jersey. Um, trade shows for retailers and games are just kind of a nice excuse to um, talk with publishers and designers about games that are coming up and how they're going to be treated at retail, if they've got OP kits or um, if they want feedback. There's lots of cool things that um, that can happen at these trade shows and this one was for a distributor I didn't know very well so it's Peach State Distribution um, which ends up being this really small sweet um, group of people who are beyond beyond nice and they welcomed me and they took care of me all week it was really sweet of them all but um, so I got to play uh, Mystic Veil vale, which is the new game from AEG where it has a bunch of uh, cards that come in sleeves and um, it's instead of a deck builder you actually draft these like clear overlay cards and you build the cards so they like slot into the sleeve and whatever peeks through at the top is the new version of this card right pardon me I'm gonna smash Uh, so the Mystic Veil, vale, um, the turn is pretty neat, so at the end of your turn, you reveal cards until you see uh, three red symbols, right? So those are your cursed lands or whatever. And at the beginning of your next turn, you have the option of pressing your luck and revealing more cards, um, as, as many as you like, one at a time. Um, if ever you reveal a fourth curse, your turn is over, and it basically just banks you a possible mana to use on future turns, but most of the time you're, you're going to be hurting if you lose a whole turn. Um, but that part of the game is pretty neat because there's not every game that uses Press Your Luck so interestingly. Um, and then you take all of the mana that you produce in the turn and you can uh, purchase cards with it. So similar to Valeria Card Kingdoms, um, you can use symbols as well as the mana to purchase cards that have bigger effects that are different than the cards that you put into your deck. Um, and those ones usually give you some sort of benefit or permanent ability. The full game took us about maybe an hour, maybe a little bit more. And we played on the kind of more easy demo mode, which is unfortunate. I understand why they do that, but they basically give you twice as many of the easy cards to draft instead of the, the harder ones. So in our game, our demo game, there was a lot less press your luck than I think there will be in the full game. So I look forward. I have a copy of that coming early June to do a full review of. I'm really excited about it. it I had a lot of fun and I don't often do that many deck builders. So it was a really interesting one to start on. Um, so I also got to peek at the new Guildhall decks. So Guildhall, also from AG, uh, came out a few years ago. Um, it came up on my Facebook feed memories just a couple days ago, the first time I played the original. So it's been a couple years and it got you know nominated for some awards and a lot of buzz and then when it actually hit the shelves, it didn't do so well. Um, I think it suffered from two big problems. The art was really kind of weird. Um, it had this like giant pig farmer on the cover and it was a little off-putting. The price tag and the weight of the box didn't quite work. It just nothing 
nothing lined up really well for that game to do well. So only people that actually tried it would buy it. Um, but so Guild Hall, you basically um, every turn you can play cards in front of you, and it's a set collection game because the the cards that you play are going to check what you've banked previously and give you different abilities based on how many of that type of card that you banked. Um, really fun, really light. I quite liked it. I traded mine away a little while ago, but I did I did enjoy it quite a bit. So these will be tinier, like form factor, new uh, abilities, and kind of a mix and match type thing. So there's like a starter set called the Fellowship, and then there's uh, two other sets, and they're both coming out really, really soon. Um, AG did some kind of cool promo stuff for it too that should be going to most shops, and at least giving you the opportunity to get demos for your store. So. <laughs> We're going to see if this format works out at all, because it's going to be really funny if this is horrible. But, um, you know, girls got to eat. And honestly, the number of vlogs that I film and don't post are quite a few. So if I can just get myself to post more often, I think overall this is all going to be very good. So what's the reason why I'm doing this post today and I must must do it? Um, you know, this is a celebration for me. I posted for the first time I opened up myself onto Patreon.com. Uh, you may have seen the launch video and honestly I was so nervous that I'd have a bunch of people unsubscribing and leaving and saying mean things because I've seen it happen to other people but honestly I've been just bowled over with everybody's support and love and um, not that the numbers are not that the numbers are everything but I hit $100 a month in 24 hours of launch and um, I didn't cry then I'm not gonna cry right now um, but it was just really special to me and it really says something about what I've done and what I've built and what community I have and that the time I spend making these videos is actually worthwhile, I guess. Um, so that's that's something. <laughs> um, so thank you all if you did see the Patreon launch. Uh, I really appreciate it. And um, I have huge amounts of people to thank specifically. I'm going to make a little Patreon slide at the end of all my videos for some of the backers. And while they fit, I'll have cute little sentences next to your name um, just as extra thank you. Eventually, hopefully, I won't have room for that. But, you know, I'm not I'm not putting that cart in front of the horse. Uh, I'm going to grab some butter. So the trade show was about two days. It's like an evening, a whole day, and then a morning. Um, and the the fun part about the morning before I left was that you spend time in the warehouse where they keep um, their games and you kind of you get to walk around and kind of see the warehouse and I felt bad for the people that work there every day because you're you know in the middle of their mess but I was walking through and this is one of the older warehouses for the company and they have all these like super older uh, Rio Grande games and Robinsberger games um, so I'm sitting there looking at copies, like saleable copies of Hamburgum and some Cordo and just some other like cool little games. So I did pick up a couple out of print numbers and I did see they have a huge stash of Mr. Jack. So I'm hoping they'll put that available to order soon. All right, so um, onions and garlic in the pan there. Wine in the glass here. Um, so cheers everybody, a little cooking juice. So what else do we do? The trade show, um, so lots of companies are there, right? And uh, Stephen Bonacore was there from Stronghold Games because he lives in New Jersey, like five minutes away from where the trade show was. And it was really interesting to talk with him. He was um, getting people to try animals on board. I don't know if you've seen that, but Mina's Fresh Cardboard has been playing it, so I know she's got a review coming. Um, but I spied with my little eye a copy of Bear Valley. And so Bear Valley is an upcoming Carl Chudik game. Carl Chudik traditionally has worked a lot with Asmati games. Um, and 
I guess Stephen had chatted with them about whether or not Carl had any designs, you know, that he wanted to put out under Stronghold's name. And so it's going to be the next in the pocket size games like Diamonds was. And Bear Valley is a press your luck game where you're trying to race from one side of the board to the other. Reminding me a little bit of the premise of Cartagena. But in Bear Valley, every time you want to move anywhere, you kind of declare where you're going to put a tile, you reveal the, or the card, and you kind of deal with the consequences. And you can press your luck several times throughout the, the turn, um, and the higher the number gets, the closer you are to bear death. So if you run into bears, you can give them snacks and stuff, but if you press your luck too much and a bear attacks you, you actually die. So there are definite reasons to stop <laughs> when you're really going. Um, I thought it was really fun. It is on the very, very light side. But we played out four players and it was perfectly fine. And I think it's going to be one of those rare games that I might like at the six player level where it's completely chaotic. Um, we will see though. That should be out in June. Uh, all right. This is way harder while you're trying to chop things and not cut your hand off. Uh, another game I got to see while I was out there was uh, World's Fair 1893. Um, it's coming out from Renegade Games, and uh, the Renegade rep is Sarah, and I love her to death. So um, I just saw her at the pre-party, and I went to sit next to her because I was a little nervous to chat with strangers. Um, and she invited me into this game because she's the sweetest person ever. Um, it was a pretty neat little action selection game. It's on the very, very light side, so I don't know that it's for me or my group, but it was certainly an interesting family game. Um, it had only one aspect that I probably would have just gotten rid of, which was these kind of weird turn order cards. Uh, they never change, and they could just be like a start player marker and clockwise for the rest of the game, but that was, that was the one thing I thought in the whole game that just didn't flow very well. But, I mean, that's easy enough to house rule or just ignore and use the regular way because it wasn't so bad that I wouldn't use it. Okay, so for Patreon, um, to get a little more specific on there, uh, when you launch Patreon, it allows people to pay you some dollars and um, you can make goals and make promises, you can make rewards. Um, my big thing is that I didn't want to do any physical rewards because I've seen that exhausts people really fast. So all of my rewards are going to be online. Um, I am doing one thing that I wanted to talk about a little bit is that for $20 a month, um, at least one month, I will take your prototype and give you a feedback video. Um, if you wanted continued feedback, I would just ask that you continue backing at that dollar amount, but I understand that that's quite a bit of investment. Um, but it's worth it, let me tell you, because if you ever need balance, to be tested in a game, that's where I really shine. It's trying to suss out what things are overpowered or underpowered, not useful, or just extra in a game. That's, that's what I'm good for. Um, the one thing I'd like to invite everyone to, and this is not just Patreon backers, um, so on the 29th of May in 2016, if you're watching this after the fact, I will be doing a Google Hangout 10 a.m. Pacific Standard Time, so that's minus eight. Um, that will be a Google Hangout. We're going to have some fun. We may watch a video or something together, uh, just like a movie or something on Netflix. Um, I'm going to get some cereal and hang out for the morning and chat with people. So if you have questions or you'd like some back, uh, background or some more information, please join us. It's the 29th at 10 a.m. If you are a patron of mine, you will get a uh, notice through Patreon, they'll send you an email and stuff. Um, so, done a little bit of gaming this week. Uh, we played just some light stuff the other night. We played uh, code names with Dixit cards, and we played, uh, what did we play? Um, played Isle of Sky, and we played Camelot and Gravwell. Just nice light things. We had someone with us that had never played a board game before. And so the codenames with the Dixit cards is always pretty popular and stuff. It's just a nice way of changing up the format a little bit and making it a little bit different. Um, we, 
as I said, we were playing with a really new player, so we didn't put a lot of restrictions on what could or couldn't be said, because he kind of wanted everyone to have a nice time. Um, so there were some really experienced board gamers, and then one pretty darn new guy, and we didn't really want to overwhelm him. So we kept it pretty loosey-goosey. Um, but last night, I got to play two new games for me. Uh, I played a game called Stratos, and I played a game called Small City. Um, and I know Small City is the thing you want, so <laughs> I will talk a little bit about it. I only got the one learning game in, so not a whole lot of insight yet. Uh, so for Stratos, it was this little game company up in Canada, and they sent me a review copy of this game, um, you know, in exchange for checking it out and doing a review. Uh, I will be sending them some feedback to see if they'd like me to continue and do a review or if they want me to try and send it to a different reviewer. Because honestly, I'll, I'll be honest, Stratus is an interesting idea done by people who don't know how to play test games. And I know that they're going to see this, so I love you guys and you're really sweet and I like what you've done with a lot of Stratus. There's women playable characters and some interesting art, but there's no balance to the game. So, uh, in the game, you set up some boards according to the scenario. So, you might just be in a free-for-all, everybody puts out characters and tries to kill each other. You might have uh, specific characters trying to do a specific thing. And that was one thing I really loved about this design. It was just a neat idea. Um, after you buy the game, more scenarios can come out online and you can download them and try them on your own. And there were just some really cool bits to that. Uh, so for me, that was an interesting part, and that was one of the big things that got me to ask them to send me a review copy. Because um, honestly, I just don't do that very often. I Every once in a while, I've gotten review copies here and there, but it always is kind of... It's always kind of another conversation or something that makes that go. It's not usually that I reach out to people. Um, so... We played a learning game, it was a four-player free-for-all, so everybody starts with a kind of a peasant in their corner, and then each character you put out on a turn gets two actions, and you can have up to five characters. So on a given turn, you have up to ten actions, right? Um, which was already kind of problematic when we read that rule, because if I'm ahead and I have more guys out and I'm killing you faster than you can spawn new guys, I'm just getting extra actions no matter what, and that just, it's all of a, you know, that win more attitude. And that was the problem with the whole game, was just this win more. So you have your characters out and you're walking around this board and one of your characters is really good at picking up resources, right? So if you have a peasant or a cultivator over a spot, you can roll a d4 to get some resources. And if you have them on their unleveled up side, they can miss with, by rolling a 4. Which, this is the only game where you don't want to really roll the, the max on any die. Uh, so I whiffed on at least 4 rolls while having peasants, if not more. Um, which was kind of a source of frustration for one player. Um, and then you get points for killing other people, for spawning mages and using their spells. You get points for occupying the middle, which also gives you additional benefits. Um, and you get points for having five leveled up guys. So everything in the game is like rewarding you if you're already doing well, and it gives you advantages if you're already doing well. And it just, it felt very luck dependent on the die roll, which is not necessarily a balance issue for me. Um, if that's what your game is, that's what your game is. I'm not one for much for dice, but that that's fine. Um, I like the combat system. It's just you roll a d6 and you do that much damage, or you roll a d4 and you do that much damage. But there is a little fiddliness. If they're not leveled up characters, they whiff if you hit a 4 or a 6. And um, there are this, the spells themselves change the layout of the game, and so the guy in the lead, I started walking toward him with big strong dudes, and he used a spell that just put water in front of me, and there's no way to walk through water with those types of characters, so it just basically cut me off and he got to retreat for two turns, and he went from, so game win is 10 points, he went from three points on one turn to the ability to get way more than 10 points on his next turn. So it was a really crazy fast swingy game. Um, 
So, uh, lovely art, beautiful board, really good. Some thoughtful ideas went into how the game is designed. I feel like that game would need sort of a rules overhaul. Uh, it needs something clever. Uh, we talked about a couple of choices. Um, one of what we thought of, instead of giving every character out on board two actions, maybe make, give a number of actions per turn and instead of this character moves one space as one action, you just say, as one action I can move up to three characters, one space, or I can, you know, those types of things might make it a little more balanced, that uh, the number of actions don't necessarily need to change by the number of standees you have on the board, and that would certainly help for people to get caught up. Um, another thing I didn't love or care for is that the costs of all the different types of characters are almost the same. There's only one that's drastically more expensive than the other ones. So it doesn't feel quite as necessary to put out the, the peasant type character that can pick up resources easily. Uh, I think I would have liked it if it was more of a tech tree where every character on the board had to start as a peasant and then you could pay resources to level them into a mage or a fighter or whatever it was. Um, I'm not sure if that's a complete rule, just as I say it now, but um, it certainly would help to make the game feel more fair. Uh, so some devastating dice rolls aren't going to kill any one person. Uh, so that was my first impression of Stratus. I haven't given up on it, but I do think that a four-player free-for-all is not the way that that game is going to shine, and I don't know that playing it with my very deep strategy buddies like I did was going to do it any favors. Everyone was pretty grumpy by the end of the game, so I will chat with them and then get back to you if I'm going to do a full review or not. It's kind of up to them at this point because there are some holes, so some companies don't really want that reflected, some do. So uh, last night we also played uh, Alvin Yard's Small City, which was, um, it was his third game I think. He's in Town Center and he did Clinique. Um, Town Center is not something I've played before. Um, I don't like a lot of city building games, so I didn't really gravitate toward it. But then uh, I picked up Clinique in 2014 when I went to Essen. Um, when I came back, I had to have it because I had played it while I was over there. Um, so Clinique is kind of a very unique hospital building game. And then uh, Town Center came out, and my friend Erwin insisted that I get it, which I... I love that he did that, so that was really sweet of him. Um, so Town Center is a kind of city planning game. You're trying to be the big mayor at the end of the game, so you kind of put things in place to build up the civics and residential neighborhoods and stuff so that once the voting time comes around, you're going to be the head honcho. Um, it's, it's very cool. So the idea is there are eight phases, just eight. Um, and in each phase, you're going to be doing some sort of something to build buildings and maintain the, the people. There is also a pollution track. So, mind you, this was my first game, so I need more games before I do a full review. But, uh, so our first game, the only hiccups that we really had were trying to remember what phases went when. I know that it's kind of depicted on the board, but it's sort of an intuitive I think I would have rather had a written out English player aid. Um, we played with just the regular parks version. Uh, I have been told since then that I really need to play the park variant, so I printed it out and brought it home. Um, so the first part of the game, uh, you put out cards, right? You put them in a circle, and the cards kind of form a rondelle. If I'm first player, I'm the mayor, uh, players get a chance to put the little mayor meeple onto my board to block two squares. It's because I get first crack at two things during the round, so they get to put me at a disadvantage. Um, also, uh, what I saw was that there is a peaceful mayor variant where uh, the mayor being put onto your board is not as big a penalty, but it is definitely a penalty in the regular version, which is kind of why Rada didn't like it originally. Um, I'm not sure that he played with the more peaceful mayor variant, but it was more up his alley to do so. Um, for us, it was just fine. Um, and then after the cards are out, each player in turn order is going to choose one to give them an effect for the turn, so it's kind of role selection. Uh, the first player puts theirs on for free, and then the next player can put 
to the right or left of the card that you chose for free, or they can pay a coin to go one out, or two coins to get two out, and uh, three coins in our instance, there were eight cards, so they could pay three coins to get to the opposite side. Then the third player can go to either side of the second player's choice for free, or pay one for the next one, two for the next one. Um, when they're looking at that, they, they skip over wherever the first player played. Uh, then you have um, kind of this building phase, and the building is really weird. Uh, there's like these spheres of influence, and you can't put like residential next to industrial, and so there's lots of restrictions on where things can go, and your board is super, super tiny. So in like, I don't know, an eight by eight, all the pieces are one by one, two by one, three by one, whatever. Um, so you all kind of simultaneously build up to three things, and upgrade things if they qualify for being upgraded. Upgrades cost nothing. Building costs money usually or resources. If you build the most basic size, the one by ones, they all give you something extra special. Uh, and the residentials, lo and behold, at the end of it, we finally figured this out, how very important it is to have the little itty bitty residentials because that's where your meeples are gonna be able to move out of your city hall. The meeple movement in this game is super funky. You need to get guys on your board because there's worker placement spots on all the buildings that you're building. You also need to put markers on other people's boards. They go out as tourists. And you need to keep that fueled by having empty factory spaces and that'll give you more meeples. And for all the little one size residential buildings, you can move guys out of your civic building into those. And there's just like this really weird path of me meeples and they're all kind of unintuitive, it's always one step past where you want it to be, so it's very, uh, like, the first round can be kind of frustrating. Um, money was not that tight for us, but I suspect that it will get tighter as we get better at the game. Um, and then there are uh, these crazy other things, like every time you add guys to your board, guys are always going to give you pollution. As soon as anybody at the board is above 10 pollution, you are going to start uh, killing off people. They're going to die of... Uh, pollution influence based on who got the most pollution that round. Uh, however, if someone sent a tourist to your town, you can kill off their tourists unless they built protections against that. Um, and then those dead guys, like antiquities, they fill up sp spaces on your board, so you kind of have to build around them. And as soon as you have a dead guy on your board, it becomes a cemetery, and then all the other dead guys need to naturally grow out of that. Um, so there are eight rounds, and the game goes really fast, and you don't feel like you're building enough, and um, it's it was incredibly engaging. Uh, I can't wait for another play. Uh, the tourism thing gives you a little bit of money when you're sending out to other people's stuff. You can take one of their best worker placement spots, which is really cool. Um, so I'm looking very much forward to my next play of it. Uh, it looks like it'll be right up my alley. Um, that's it for me for now. I'm going to edit this together while the soup boils everything down. Um, and I hope that y'all are having a nice day. Thank you very much for everyone that left my Patreon this week. Uh, I really appreciate it. If you've never been to Patreon, it is not so bad. If you want to give it a shot, shot it's patreon.com slash Uh Otherwise, I will see you on the Twitters and the Board Game Geeks. Bye, everybody.